So this is part two of a response to a great question that I had, which is how to make transcription into a more regular habit. The first video looks at how to make anything into a regular habit. Uh, and this video is going to examine my personal approach to transcription and some hints and tips on how to make it a little less daunting. So what is transcription? I'm going to define it as the act of capturing a musical idea using notation as accurately as possible. So simply put, we're hearing music and we're writing it down. Why would you want to do that? Well, I think that transcription is one of the most beneficial activities you can do as a musician. It's sort of like the musical equivalent of a squat or a deadlift or a pull up. It's a compound exercise. It works lots of different musical attributes at the same time. So it's quite an efficient way of practicing. What does it work on? Obviously your ears. That's the first thing. It's a great way of training your ears to hear musical phrases. Um, it develops your fluency in both reading and writing notation. It helps your understanding of musical form and structure. Uh, it's a great way of developing technique, much more so uh, than those sort of one, two, three, four finger independence exercises or just playing things derived from scales. Much better to practice music. And if you're transcribing something particularly that's not from a bass, maybe you're working on a saxophone solo or something or a piano thing, you will find that it is really, really challenging for your technique more so than any sort of baseline that you can find. Um, transcription also puts the theory into context. Now, quite often there's a bit of a disconnect between learning scales, arpeggios, other things, you know, other theoretical concepts, and then actually being able to apply them in context on the instrument. And if you're transcribing, um, a bass pair that you like the sound of and you find that they're using certain theoretical concepts that shows you when and where and how you can apply those theoretical ideas onto the instrument in the real world so it's really useful for that it's a great tool for acquiring language and vocabulary and what it allows you to do effectively is take a lesson with any player that you like it doesn't matter if they're alive or dead you can have a lesson with them if you want to take a lesson with charlie parker for instance you can transcribe his solos or Ray Brown, you can transcribe his bass lines. Doesn't matter who it is, doesn't matter what style of music, you can get an insight into their thought process. And it's a really effective way of getting authentic vocabulary from any genre of music you like. It doesn't matter if you're pursuing, um, you know, bebop playing or death metal. If you find a player, player in those genres that you like the sound of, you can steal their licks just by transcribing them. And it's free. So how do we go about transcribing? Transcription in itself requires quite a particular set of skills. What I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Exactly. So the most obvious skill that you need is the ability to hear what it is you're transcribing. So to that end, you need to be able to match pitch accurately. Um, I would always, always recommend using your voice to verify pitches uh, rather than hunting for it on a bass or a piano or any other instrument that you might be using to transcribe. Uh, you need to be able to accurately hear what the note is um, and what we call the melodic contour, so the shape of the melody. Um, within that is the ability to instinctively recognize intervals, both melodic and harmonic. Melodic intervals are, as it sounds, in a melody or a bass line, one note at a time moving between notes. Uh, harmonic intervals are notes within a chord, multiple notes at the same time which can often be far trickier to isolate and to hear. Um, and then also an overlooked skill that's really important is being able to isolate a bass part in a mix. And that's particularly difficult if it's an older recording and things are quite muddy. Um, so if you've ever gone through the ordeal, which is trying to transcribe um, an upright walking bass line from the 1950s, you'll know um, this is a complete headache. And even on more modern recordings, when the lower end of the mix is quite crowded with synths and um, kick drums and floor toms and stuff like that, it's often quite hard to hear what the bass is actually playing with any real degree of clarity, um, and that will come over time. So how do you develop good ears? Unfortunately, most bass players tend to studiously avoid any sort of formal ear training because it's really dull and it takes forever to have any real effect or at least um, it did for me my ears are still very much a work in progress um, and they're improving steadily surely slowly but they're nowhere near where i want to be so how have i got my ears together the things that i have found most helpful uh, the first of which is singing that might be horrible news for most people, but um, 
it's this is like the ultimate test as to whether you're hearing something you can't fake it with singing because in order to accurately sing something you have to accurately pre-hear it so you can't sing something unless you can hear it you can't hear it unless you can sing it so that's always a good test as to whether you're hearing stuff accurately is can you sing it um things to do to work on that learn how to sing all the intervals within the major scale and the minor scale from any given root note that's a great test um also look for sight singing books you can often find them in charity shops for not very much money because um obviously people have tried to use them found it horrific and then got rid of them so you can pick them up pretty cheaply um, either in charity shops or online um, but those are great really hard work really difficult but worth doing in terms of really learning your intervals thoroughly uh, there are lots of different software packages and apps on the market for ear training my favorite is actually a free one called functional ear trainer which utilizes the same method that the great jazz educator charlie minakos used to use with his students and that is to play a cadence um, and then have a student identify any given note relative to that key center. So here's how the app works. Let's put myself on the spot and see if I can get it right. You're gonna hear a cadence and then a given note. It's two. Okay. That sounds like a fourth. One more. Sounds like a sixth. Happy days. Ah, a flat nine. Anyway, that's enough of that. So that's a great app to use. I tend to use that anytime I'm stuck waiting for something and I can't do anything else constructive. So if I'm waiting for a train or a bus or if I'm stuck in line at the post office, whatever, I'll put my headphones in and try and get 20 quick intervals out. So that's a good thing to try. Other things that have helped me with ear training, there's a great book by Ron Goro called Hearing and Writing Music, which is fairly hefty, several hundred pages long. Um, I only have it on PDF, but the physical copy weighs a ton. It's a great, really in-depth method about how to transcribe. His thing is about being able to transcribe without an instrument, which is really hardcore, and I'm definitely not there yet, but it definitely helped me get a handle on intervals. Um, the idea or the goal is to get to the point where all the intervals within the chromatic scale are completely familiar with you, are completely intuitive. Um, Charlie Bernacos used to say that you need to hear intervals and recognize them in the same way that you recognize familiar voices of your friends or your family. So if your phone rings and you pick it up without looking at it and it's your dad, you know it's your dad within the first two words because his voice is that familiar. You need to get to that same point of familiarity with intervals again regardless of the instrument they're played on regardless of the context that they're played in you need to be able to hear a fifth instantly so that takes a long time and again i'm not there yet sometimes i mishear things um and it's just a, it's always a work in progress one of the most time consuming aspects of transcription uh, particularly in the early days is being able to accurately notate rhythms so you need to be able to hear a musical phrase and instinctively know how it's going to look on paper. So to that end, you need to be conscious of the time signature, uh, the rhythmic feel, which can actually have quite a lot of variation and have a, has a massive impact on how you notate things. So is it a straight eighth thing? Is it swung eighths? Is it straight eighths but swung sixteenths? Is it a triplet thing? Is it a shuffle? Things like that all have um, a huge bearing on how things look on the page. So how do you develop those skills? Unfortunately, the answer is you need to get better at reading music. Your ability to read music directly relates to your ability to write things down. So things that I have done to improve that, um, books that I've used to work on my reading. Modern Reading Text in 4-4 by Louis Belson. This is a book for drummers, but that doesn't mean that we can't do everything that they can do equally well, if not better. Um, it's unfortunately about 100 odd pages of syncopation studies so we're just going to play one note but in every possible rhythmic combination going uh, great cure for insomnia and really effective not fun but very very nutritious uh, if you're feeling particularly masochistic there is also an odd time version um, if you're feeling like a, a real challenge in addition to that so when i practice sight reading 
um, particularly when you're learning to read, I would advocate working on rhythm and pitch separately before doing combination exercises. Um, that's what I use for rhythm. For pitch, the Simandl Upright book is great. New method for the double bass. Even though this is a double bass book, it, I used it on electric for many years before I even thought about playing the double bass. Um, the exercises are nice and melodic. Rhythmically, they're very straightforward, so it allows you to just focus in on pitch. Uh, and most of them fit nicely into one position on the fretboard. So very good training in playing your instrument without looking at it. If you've been sight reading for a while, you might want a bigger challenge. Um, and it's nice eventually to just play some good lines. And for that, I would recommend the Standing in the Shadows of Motown book, the, the Jameson book, which features a bunch of big name players uh, playing famous lines from Jameson with varying degrees of authenticity and success. Very interesting to listen to the recordings and hear who actually grew up playing Jameson um, and who's actually just very good at sight reading. A lot of your ability to write music um, in a reader-friendly way, and that's actually the biggest thing with transcription, is making it easy to read, even if the only person reading it is going to be you. Even if it's just for personal study, you need to be able to present it in a nice format. It's going to be more accessible. So, unfortunately, the way to get good at writing sensible charts is to have read a lot of good transcriptions and to have read a lot of badly presented transcriptions because that under makes you understand what you need to avoid. Um, at a bare minimum, you need to understand harmonic conventions about writing things in a key signature. You need to know your major scales in all 12 keys, inside and out, um, and understand how to use accidentals and when to use enharmonic equivalents. Enharmonics are where you have the same pitch with multiple names. So. E is normally E, except when it's F flat. B is normally B, except when it's C flat. And there are certain musical situations where one would be far more appropriate than the other, and you need to know those. In addition to knowing how to transcribe, you also need to decide what you're going to transcribe. So I would recommend starting out with something that you're really, really familiar with, something that you're comfortable with on a playing level, you might have even learned to play it by ear already, but you may not have ever tried to write it down. That's a good place to start. Give yourself an easy win. Don't try and transcribe Coltrane's solo from Giant Steps as your first thing to do, because chances are you'll get beaten and you won't come back to it. Okay? Related to that, if you're not into it, don't transcribe it. Don't be a slave to what other people say that you should be working on. Unless it's a teacher and you know they have a well-informed opinion um, about you know specific things that you need to be working on in your playing that you can only get from transcription that's fine but in general you have to go after the sound that you love uh, and you will get better results from that if you only pursue things that you know really really light a fire inside you you're going to be much more likely to see it through and complete the transcription um, if you're into it then if it's just something that someone has told you to do for the sake of it on that point don't be afraid of transcribing things that lots of other people have already transcribed. So uh, I avoided learning lots of Jacko stuff early on because I was very aware that almost everyone else had checked him out um, and I didn't want to just sound like everybody else. But here's the thing. If you really like a player, go for it. Transcribe them, you know, get as deep into their sound as you can because you won't end up sounding like them not completely because they had different influences to you. You have a lot of influences that might not be Jacko. And if you get five different bass players to transcribe the same solo, chances are they will all gravitate towards different things in that solo, different licks, different phrases, um, and they will end up playing those things differently. They will hear them differently um, and it will come out differently in their playing. So don't shy away from sort of classic things that you think have already been done to death because you will get different things from them um, that other people did not. When selecting things to transcribe, it's important to bear in mind that, musically speaking, you are what you eat. Um, Michael Lee, the bass player from Snarky Puppy, um, has a great thing which I heard in an interview with him, I think, from Bass Lessons Melbourne, uh, which is a great bass player in Australia called Craig, who does lots of interviews with some great players. So worth checking out, I'll put links in the description and in the blog post of those. But in an interview with Michael Lee, Mike said that when you improvise, when you play, you play what's in your record collection. And when you write music, you write what is in your record collection. So if you transcribe something, it'll come out in your playing. 
So it's worth focusing your attention to make sure that you get the best results. Um, to that end, if you're looking to be you know, a stronger groove player, to play better bass in the traditional sense, then transcribe lots and lots of great bass grooves. If you want inspiration, uh, then it's obviously worth checking out my Groove of the Week series. Um, but the more great lines that you know, the higher the chance of you playing great lines when it comes to you improvising bass playing. So worth doing that. If you're looking to transcribe some sort of improvised solo, avoid bass players. Why? Generally speaking, bass players know very, very little about melody, harmony or rhythm. I say that as a bass player. Anyway, um, a lifetime of playing the root note as our primary job description makes it very difficult for us to uh, get better at outlining harmony in a more grown up way. So I would always recommend gravitating towards saxophone players, piano players, even guitarists, because they all have a much broader harmonic palette, um, much more sophisticated harmonic concepts. Their range of articulation and phrasing is also a lot more varied than most bass players. So if you study things that they have played, you will end up sounding a little bit more highly evolved than most bass players who've just listened to Victor Wooten or Marcus Miller, um, things like that. Related to that, a lot of bass players that solo often end up using sort of techniques which focus on technique rather than music. So slapping, tapping, things like that. My objection to those is that they are often style over content they focus on the technique and they get the listener to hear the technique rather than the musical concept and it often leads people to listen with their eyes rather than their ears but that's just my opinion uh, if you're really into slap bass transcribe as much as you can learn it learn it really well get it inside your playing um, and enjoy it having said you should avoid bass players is actually a couple of exceptions i think Jacko, obviously, um, Jeff Berlin and Jeff Andrews. Um, I found transcribing them helpful because it gives me an idea of what is possible and what is realistic given the limits of our instrument. So that's worth checking out, I think. The first point is fairly obvious, but it needs saying, and that is saturated listening. You need to get incredibly familiar with the piece of music that you're trying to transcribe. Um, I would recommend making a transcription playlist, uh, putting it on your phone and then just listening to it whenever you have to go somewhere, whenever you're on a train, on a bus, walking around, whatever. Uh, Ran Blake's excellent book, Primacy of the Ear, which is about as entertaining as an ear training book can get, is very good for lots of advice on this area. I'll put the link in the blog. I've also written an article about it. Uh, I'll link to that as well. I won't go into any more detail right now. Work with small phrases it's really important don't bite off more than you can chew uh, go for one bar at a time or even if it's a really complicated thing aim for one beat's worth of music at a time that's plenty of information to be able to deal with get that little chunk together and then move on and then pretty soon you'll have a much bigger transcription rather than you know trying to hear a four bar phrase or hear an eight bar phrase all at once unless it's very simple um, that's going to be quite a difficult thing to achieve another tip related to starting out small is to not try and transcribe for too long at a stretch. Um, do it in small chunks and take regular breaks because your ears are like any other muscle, they get fatigued if you use them for too long and you have to build up their strength over time, particularly if you're not used to doing it. So take regular breaks to avoid ear fatigue. I find that if I try and push myself a bit, you know, too long or too hard, I, I make really, really silly errors. I mishear things um, and I will come back to a transcription and be horrified at the stupid mistakes that I've made. So if you're starting to feel beaten up by it, if you're starting to get fatigued, take a break, come back to it tomorrow, start fresh. The most important thing with any transcription, actually, uh, and this is something that I have overlooked in the past and failed to do, is learn the damn thing that you're transcribing. Really learn it inside out. You want to get it into your bones, into your musical DNA. Otherwise, it's just a sort of a dry exercise um, in working out if your skills are up to hearing and writing something down. You need to learn it to get the most value out of it. So there's a huge difference in time and effort expended and the mastery that you gain with something uh, between practicing it until you get it right and then playing it so much that you can't get it wrong. 
and that's the goal is to play something so often and with such focus and commitment that it becomes part of you that you physically can't get it wrong if you try um, and that's a good yardstick as to whether or not you've learned something deeply enough uh, the goal is to be able to play it along with the recording and make it sound like there's just one instrument you don't want to hear any difference in notes time feel phrasing articulation you don't want to hear any discrepancies between you and the person that you are transcribing you want to get inside their playing as deeply as possible so to go along with that i would recommend always transcribing with the bass in your hand okay it's pretty virtuous to transcribe away from any instrument at all that's a really uh, time consuming process i'm definitely not there yet um, for anything more than something fairly rudimentary um, i did spend some time transcribing things at a piano because i went to a clinic with yannick wisdala and that's what he said that he did and it helped him get his piano playing together i wanted to get mine together so i thought i'd transcribe at the piano my piano playing skills improved by roughly one percent um, and then i found that i'd have to spend a lot of time going back and relearning it on a bass so as a shortcut just learn it on the bass straight away um, there will be a lot of things particularly if you're transcribing non-bass instruments a lot of things will necessitate having to arrange lines for the bass having to display things in different octaves um, if you're transcribing a chordal instrument you might not be able to play every note in the chord that they are playing so you have to um, make a choice and you have to work out how lines fit on the instrument according to your level of technique and your preferences for playing things in a certain way in an ideal world work out more than one way of playing it that might not always be possible but you have to approximate whatever you're transcribing for your instrument Coming back to a point I made earlier about the fact that it's often difficult to isolate the bass line um, and to hear it with any sort of clarity, uh, a good tip is to use EQ, particularly if you're using uh, a software package like Logic or Pro Tools or something similar like that. You can boost the frequencies um, in the bass register, so typically 100 hertz to 250, maybe slightly above that. Um, boost that a little bit and it'll help to bring out the bass line to clarify um, when it's a bass and when it's a floor tom or a synth or a kick drum or something that might be masquerading um, as a bass it's also sometimes helpful if th this depends on the song if the song is particularly laden with guitars and keyboards and other such things you might cut some of the high frequencies again to expose what's going on in the lower registers and that can be particularly helpful um, in clarifying an otherwise muddy mix so one question that always crops up when talking about transcription is to slow down or not slow down recordings. So some players like John Patitucci, Yannick Wisdala, uh, Rufus Philpott, and the sax player Bob Reynolds, who plays for Snarky Puppy, among other people, um, they all say that you shouldn't use slowing down software and that you should just try and do it in real time at tempo because that's how music happens in real life. That's what happens on gigs. You can't break out. Um, the amazing slowdown on a gig and decipher what someone just played you need to hear it in the moment um, and they argue that using slowing down software sort of limits you and acts as a crutch when you're transcribing um, now there are other players who you know whose opinion is equally valid um, sax players like Seamus Blake and David Liebman who has actually released um, a DVD that's now discontinued I think it's pretty hard to get a hold of um, through legitimate means <laughs> is a very very in-depth method for transcription for students um, it's very laborious time consuming but obviously because of that it's very very effective um, and if I was more determined I would apply that principle to everything that I transcribe um, I'll link to the PDF that's floating about on the internet which details his method um, it involves transcription graphs and such which I've talked about in previous uh, videos and blog posts but he definitely advocates learning solos at half speed to start with and for me when I have used slowing down software I use QuickTime Player 7 um, because it's a nice free way of altering the speed of the music you can also use it to alter the pitch quite quickly which is great um, but when I've used that it has always brought out some subtlety in the articulation or the phrasing that I missed when listening to things at full speed now I'm trying not to use slow down software as a crutch I don't want it to be a habitual thing that I do every time um, I will always endeavor first and foremost 
to try and hear music at tempo but sometimes my ears are not up to it or my patience is not up to it and one of my principal goals in transcription is to be as accurate as possible so to that end i will use um i will slow things down to help me hear things with the most accuracy uh, at the moment i'm transcribing a pat metheny solo and slowing down some of the faster phrases has revealed the way he picks things the way that he slurs between notes um, and also really helps me get a handle on the phrasing and the time feel and how much uh, he swings particular phrases and how he plays other phrases straight and I missed that information when I listened to it at the original tempo so slowing down things can be quite a useful way of unearthing some of the subtleties particularly um, in the rhythmic phrasing of lines so as with any discussion about any subject ever some people will always ask questions about gear and about equipment because i think it absolves them of any responsibility about their own playing or their own skill set um, i know it does for me so it's very easy to make excuses about lack of progress in any area uh, related to not having the correct equipment but the good news is that for transcription you don't really need very much uh, i have a couple of different ways of doing it depending on where i am so if I'm here in the studio, I will run my bass into an interface, the Apogee One, doesn't matter what interface you use, you just need to get your bass into a laptop and be able to hear it. In the laptop, I use Logic to import the audio file and to loop certain sections. I find that things like iTunes and Spotify are unusable for transcription because you can't scrub and loop very easily. You can't isolate small sections of songs and loop them over and over again so i use logic sometimes i'll use quicktime 7 as an alternative so you don't need um, an expensive thing like logic or pro tools or anything like that you can use a free bit of software that loops recordings i use sibelius for writing things down you can of course use the old school method of pen and paper um, there are a lot of reasons why i don't do that anymore i used to do a lot of it i used to write things down by hand um, my handwriting is terrible and often I couldn't read what I'd written. Uh, I find it very time consuming. It's much quicker to use Sibelius. It's much easier to duplicate things, transpose, rearrange things using Sibelius. Um, and on a storage level, I probably have 600 or so unfinished transcriptions in my Sibelius folder. That's a lot of pieces of paper if I've written them down. So for those reasons, I use Sibelius. Other software packages are available. Lots of people get great results with things like Finale, Muse Score, Harmony Assistant, other things like that. Just because I use Sibelius doesn't mean it's the only thing available. For the mega nerds, I use Sibelius 6 because I got really quick with the, with the shortcuts and then they changed it all when they moved to 7. Lots of layout changes, which I didn't like. So I'm still sort of painting in a cave and using an outdated version of that software. Um, people always ask about headphones. so. It doesn't really matter what headphones you use so long as they have a good seal over your ear that's particularly important when you're transcribing bass lines you need a good seal to be able to hear the low end so i have two sets of headphones one of which costs 40 pounds the other some in-ear monitors which cost 400 pounds i didn't buy these for transcription i bought them for gigs it just so happens that they're really comfortable to wear and they have a pretty good bass response but if you can't hear things on a 40 pound set of headphones you won't hear them on a 400 pound set of headphones it's not a magic bullet that will suddenly mean that you can hear everything the most important determinant of that is how good are your ears how much time have you spent um, practicing transcription training your ears things like that um, the headphones the gear does not make the difference it's your ear it's not the gear so that's what i use if i'm working here if i'm at home i will tend to use again i will run things into a laptop but this time there's no interface I'll use a Vox Amplug headphone amp, which doesn't sound particularly great, but it means that I can hear myself without using an amplifier um, and I'm not annoying anyone in the immediate vicinity. I can play almost silently. Um, I will then run a very cheap aux cable out of the Amplug into the headphone jack of my laptop and then use the same software. That's it. It doesn't have to be particularly complicated or expensive. Um, you just have to get down to it and do the work. 